if you're only focused on acquisition, um, then you're probably going to get your metrics wrong and your focus wrong. If you're focused on running a really good sustainable business and constantly improving it, then you're going to be attractive for someone looking for an acquisition target. Are you seeking a better way to accelerate your sales, to scale your business, to live a life with no limits? Accelerate Sales Podcast features global experts who have cracked the code to recurring revenues with proven sales systems and get you on the fast track to scaling. Now let's accelerate your sales with today's episode. Welcome to the Accelerate Sales Podcast. You're going to learn three key things from the guest today. One is how they scaled their business to 100 people plus, people working all over the globe. The second is how they build a partnership with their vendor that has helped to bring 90% of the new clients. And the third thing is what it takes to successfully exit on your terms, your business. So welcome again to the Accelerate Sales Podcast. If it's your first time and you love what you hear, please subscribe. If you're a regular why not give me those iTunes reviews? And it's not just for me, it's for the amazing guests like the person we're having on today will get. I take, well, sorry, you take notes. You'll see me that I look down and take a lot of notes as well because there's so much value that the guest has given today. But you can also go and get a summary and more details at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash podcast. And this is episode 385. So just look for that one. And uh, today's guest is someone who said they fell into the business of cloud consulting. They were a consultant, saw an opportunity, uh, rushed to Atlanta, and uh, yeah, became a par dot consultant. And then have ridden the the beautiful wave of Salesforce, and uh, you know they help um, mid and enterprise clients, and they work across you know MuleSoft, Tableau, par dot, Salesforce Cloud and other great products that Salesforce have. And it's a, a really uh, knowledgeable um, podcast interview that the guest gives and, uh, yeah, they share so openly. So uh, get ready and uh, have a pen and paper ready or your thumbs ready if you're typing into a device. So what I'll do now is hand you over to Andrew France from Destin, which is a part of the Media Monks company. Great to have you here, Andrew. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. So as I've uh, said in the intro, you've done an amazing job to scale your uh, Salesforce business. But why don't we just kick off and be clear for everyone is, you know, who your ideal clients are at the moment? Who, who do you love to work with? Yeah, I guess like a lot of practices that have grown over time, while we started uh, with a smaller end of town, we, we definitely enjoy working with uh, mid-market and uh, enterprise clients at this point in time. Yeah, great. And and what have been sort of the big differences you noticed, particularly in the sales process of working from that smaller end to mid and enterprise? Yeah, you're obviously dealing with a whole lot of uh, decision makers in a process. And so instead of a world where uh, you can be dealing with the owner of a business uh, who can make a decision quite quickly, uh, you're walking into layers and layers of decision makers. And so uh, to be honest, that's a good thing and a bad thing. It's a great thing because that means you're opening up more budget and people are being more careful, uh, but obviously it's allowing for that time. And so where historically we can turn a deal over in a few weeks, uh, suddenly you're realising I've got to send the legal terms and conditions ahead of time. Uh, we've got to start to preempt those conversations uh, so that when you actually come to close, uh, you've got all those pieces yeah, in place. What's a typical enterprise I know it's hard, typical, right? And averages, you should never mention it, but I've, now that I have, I'll follow it through. But, you know, how long is the sales cycle at the moment for an enterprise client? Yeah, I guess for a new customer, um, you can be looking at two to three months. And, and obviously it varies on the size of investment and what they're trying to do. Um, but, yeah, that's that's not uncommon. Yeah, and is there any particular tricks or, or something that you've learned to try to reduce that from, you know, three months to to less than that? Yeah, I think there's that classic question around, are you the person who's going to make this decision in the end or are there others who need to be involved? And if you haven't got the people in the room that are making the decision, uh, then you'll suddenly get to the end of a whole process that you think you've done well, that's ready to close, and then they'll talk about, oh, by the way, it's got to go to the board or, oh, by the way, it's got to go to this next group. And so 
I think making sure decision makers are in the room and involved from very early on uh, is a really important part. Yeah, have you ever heard of uh, Miller Hyman strategic selling? Yep. Yep. Yeah, that that classic blue sheet. I you know it's still yeah. I learned that in I think might have been ninety six when I first took it through, and I use that for you know even if it's buying a house everything i basically bring out that one sheet and just say okay who are all the buyers what are their wins personal what are their wins in business and i think it's so uh, powerful and the one that just quickly that bit us the most we um the short version is that unfortunately i'm responsible for all cold soft drink uh, at the front of counters in australia so uh, i basically created that we thought we um the the retail side of all of the the retailers loved it, right? So all the merchandise people, et cetera. And yep. we got right to the right end. And then the operations people stepped in and said, well, we're not going to fill these things. We're already yep. too, too busy, right? So it's a classic case of not going through all the buying influences and really mapping it out, which ended up taking us an, an extra six months. So, uh, yeah, uh, Miller Hyman, have a look if you want. Uh, I, I'll put in the show notes a link to a little version that uh, that I've done of that. But I think that's really powerful. and. And, you know, like you said, you understand you all the people, but what are sort of the key problems that you're solving at the moment? Like what does, you know, um, your solution being Pardo solve for them at the moment? Yeah, well, we sell across the whole Salesforce stack. So okay. we're selling MuleSoft, which is an integration tool. We're selling Tableau, which is analytics. We've got sales service uh, and we've got the marketing automation products. And so... Pardot is one of those. Uh, Salesforce Marketing Cloud is another. And so the stakeholders you're talking to, obviously there's a variety of problems we're seeking to solve. I guess on the marketing side, um, especially the larger the organisation, the more data they're dealing with, the harder it is for them to bring it together and to get the insights out of it that they need. Um, I think the other thing that we're seeing too is the larger the organisation, the more siloed they are in their experience. And so if you then think about trying to take someone on an ideal customer journey, if your business is so siloed, it can be really hard to bring those pieces together. And so in some ways, we're, we're a strategic partner in bringing those conversations together. So tech is part of what we end up putting in place, but it's often helping them think through strategically, what do we want this customer journey to look like? Uh, and then how do we put the tech behind it to actually execute? Yeah, it's funny. Like back in my Coke days, we used to always talk about, you know, uh, the, the one one customer, you know, basically marketing to one customer and being very specific. I think, you know, we've come a long way now, but I think, yes, having that data so the left and the right hand uh, are working together is so important. And, you know, you've done an amazing job to scale your business now to 100 people and be a part now of a, of a global uh, agency, um, just tell us at first, you know, why did you pick Salesforce as a, as a partner? There's lots of other platforms out there. Why did you pick Salesforce in particular? Yeah, uh, you're going to be disappointed with the answer, but uh, I stumbled into it. Um, I, I was, as possibly mentioned earlier, I working, was working in a consulting firm that had just put part odd in. Uh, I decided to go off on my own. Uh, and I rang them and said, can I help you implement this? And uh, they, they checked that I had a pulse and probably not much more. And, uh, and, and I got the gig. And so I, yeah, ended up in Atlanta and uh, was their first part or partner in APAC. And so I guess uh, my due diligence was poor. Um, I mean, I was aware of Salesforce. Um, but I guess the, the beauty as I look back has been... Um, yeah, we've hitched our wagon to a group that has had a very aggressive growth uh, trajectory, but also a breadth of product, um, sometimes to their detriment, the, the number of things that get added in and so on. Uh, it happens at pace, but that's also part of their success. Yeah, was uh, there and ever, so, yeah. And sorry, was there ever a time where you thought, you know, maybe I should be multiple stack versus just on the Salesforce wagon? Yeah, I think probably quite early on um, there was some change in the part of management within Salesforce and with any new uh, people coming in to do a job, uh, they have their way of doing things and they had a good look at the partners that were in place at that time and were questioning whether 
um, we should be part of that group going forward for them. Uh, and I know at, at that point some others looked at other tech options. Uh, it's an interesting question because the while if you look at it purely from a uh, business diversification point of view, um, it, it's easy to argue, well, of course you should. Um, it, it, why hit your um, car to just one group? Um, but the reality also is that if I'm a Salesforce salesperson and I'm sitting there and I've got one partner that just sells Salesforce and then I've got another partner that I know sells a variety of solutions, um, I can have confidence that the Salesforce partner isn't going to be trying to talk to the customer I'm introducing them to about other solutions. Uh, and, and so I guess our diversification has come across the Salesforce stack so that we're in CRM, we're in Service Cloud, we're in MuleSoft and so on, uh, as opposed to necessarily being across different, um, yeah, different tech companies. So if, if Salesforce falls over, we're obviously in strife. Uh, but if for some reason we uh, annoy or let down a particular salesperson in one part of the business, um, we aren't suddenly sunk because actually we do a whole lot of work in all these other parts of the business as well. Yeah, look, and and, and I think most Salesforce partners have done a similar thing. I think, you know, you, like you said, other made choices as to what they do. I think you were right to stick with one and, and you know, Salesforce has done a brilliant job in extending the, the, the product suite they've got um, working with Salesforce, right? It is, you know, one of the best known um, tech companies in the world. It's done an amazing job. You know, what, what have you found that's made you successfully work with Salesforce that maybe some, some have missed? Yeah, look, I think our success early was that we went deep in one product and we became famous for that. So we were known as that that partner. Uh, I never did a very good job, especially early on, of engaging with senior leadership. I'm sure others did a far better job than me. But what we did do well was we helped AEs close deals. Uh, we did good work on it. And so when they got the next deal, they were comfortable talking to us. And then they talked to their colleagues and said, hey, I've worked with Destined, it's worked well, you guys should have a chat to them. And so I think, um, yeah, there's no substitute for that, that strong relationship with the salesperson who's ultimately making the decision on which partners to introduce and also no substitute for actually doing good work. And so I'm sure we went above and beyond where others maybe didn't because they held tightly and to an SOW, which ended up, uh, uh, creating issues with the customer and the Salesforce AE. Uh, yeah, I'm sure we took a hit on profit was the downside. Um, but especially early on, you're trying to build those relationships. You're trying to demonstrate that you add real value. Um, it's interesting, we've been thinking about, we're about to do a whole series of presentations to Salesforce people in the next month. Um, and we've got a whole lot of fluff early on in our deck about how good we are, how big we are now as part of a global group. And then we've got a slide that says, ah, but stop, wait a minute. Actually, you don't care about any of that. You care about whether we help you sell a deal quicker and we help you get your licenses over the line. Yeah, yeah. yeah I totally agree. And I think that's a really important point around, you know, giving up or, you know, having the End in mind, as Stephen Cover used to always say, that yes, take a bit of a hit early, you know, eat a bit of humble pie early, to know that then you build a relationship to get the long, the long term benefit. And uh, I know when we were at Coca Cola, you know, I used to try to pick the the best business operators that I knew that if we gave them a bit of a deal sweetener up front, they're going to be the guys that end up with 20, 50 stores. Yep. versus the opposite. And, you know, sometimes you've got to do that for the long haul. And, uh, you know, you've done that really successfully and, you know, you've built a team of 100. You know, which which part of the 100 was the hardest? Was it, you know, zero to 10? Was it, you know, 20 to 50? Like take us through a bit of that journey because I know a lot of people watching and listening at the moment are probably, you know, that sub 20 and they're looking at, well, you know, how different is it uh, above that? So, yeah, I'd love to get your insights into that. Yeah, I think in a lot of ways we've followed 
uh, what the textbooks tell you will happen. So you start off in those uh, early days where uh, you've got it all in your head and you uh, traditionally are sitting in an office together and you overhear everyone's conversations and and you can feel in control of it all. Uh, As you grow, you lose that connection. And so getting your own process in place early uh, is absolutely crucial. Um, I think the growth piece for us, again, richly blessed because of our relationship with Salesforce and their growth and the fact that we did good work. Um, What we found, though, was that we, yeah, we needed to get that process right. Um, We found we suddenly needed project managers where we didn't have project managers before. Um, We found that obviously we needed to be uh, tracking stuff properly in our own CRM. Um, it's like the plumber with the leaky pipe uh, as opposed to, yeah, not. And so uh, the other reason I think we did all right, and I describe it as my my fundamental laziness, um, I was always looking for things others could do so I didn't have to do them. Yes. And I think that's often what has held back others uh, leading their own businesses is that they hold on to too much for too long um, that potentially others should be doing, and yeah, uh, I think um, I think that can make a massive difference. That then frees frees you to do what you do well, and not be distracted by all the other bits that you feel like you should be controlling. Yeah, so important. And, and I know I used to have a saying to anyone that worked for me, and I still do, is that when I had an induction, I said, "There's only one key thing I want you to do," and they're like, "Oh, well, that's easy." I said, "Yeah, one key thing is any time." I do something that you think that you're all as equal or better at me at doing, kick me out of it, right? I want you to yep. be strong enough to tell me, hey, Paul, you've got better things to do than doing that because I can do it either the same as you or, or better than you. And I think it is so important about that. And uh, it's funny, like oft, often, you know, people that are into productivity and love to work hard, et cetera, that can be their biggest, you know, it's a strength overplayed. A weakness yep. because, like you said, lazy. Maybe it's just smart that you pick your battles. I think, uh, yeah, that's a really important um, thing. And you've got people across multiple um, countries, as we uh, spoke about pre the interview. Just you know, what what's it like managing people? I know you've got a big team in uh, Pakistan. You've got some in Vietnam. You've got you know some in Eastern Europe. Yeah, what's it like uh, these days, especially working on different time time zones? How, how do you sort of handle that? Yeah, yeah, good question. I'll, I'll just hit pause briefly and go back to just that other question, sorry, very quickly. Yes. I actually think you've got to be comfortable letting people do stuff and you know they're going to do it worse than you. Yeah, that's a good point. But but it's good to have them also doing it because it's one thing you're not doing. Yes. And I think people hold on to the stuff that they go, I could always do that as well as or better. And they actually need to let people do stuff worse than them but help them grow because ultimately that grows the business. Yeah, sorry, no, no, but sorry. the the um, yeah, look, it's it's been interesting. We our Karachi op- operation got set up because a guy came to me and said, "I want to set an office up for you in Karachi and create jobs for people there." Uh, and I said, "No," I said, uh, "I don't know why I'd ever want an office in Karachi. I don't know the place. I don't understand it." Yeah. Uh, and he kept harassing me. And finally, I said yes. And uh, he said, I don't want equity. I don't want to be paid for it. I just want to create jobs. Uh, and we, it took us took us um, a good six to 12 months to, we just lost money on it initially would be how I described it. Yep. But the turning point for us was getting the right guy in there to lead the operation. Uh, and actually, I would put any of our success down to finding the right person to lead something uh, as opposed to, thinking it's the right next thing and starting it uh, and then hoping it works out. Um, and so Karachi's worked brilliantly because we've found an amazing guy there who's done a brilliant job leading that operation. And so, yeah, there's just a great level of trust. I think time zones, uh, it's up and down. So the the start of day in Australia and obviously Karachi doesn't wake up for half the day uh, and that's fine. Uh, the upside of it is, though, that uh, they're then working overnight um, when we're not working. And so 
you do need to obviously have good uh, good time of crossover so that you can work effectively. Uh, but if you've got the right people in place and the right process, and this has been just constant learning for us, so it can be really easy for a consultant uh, Australia based to go, oh, it's just easy to do it myself. And so if I don't make it easy for them to hand the work over and for those in those other locations to pick that work up and do it effectively, then they're not going to hand it over. And so working with teams that are, um, I guess, call it back-end teams, that piece of the puzzle is absolutely essential that you get that process right. Um, yeah. Yeah, great. And and moving on now to a little bit more around sales. So, you know, you've been able to scale the business, which has been brilliant. You know, as a rough rule of thumb, how much has come from Salesforce and how much has come from your own efforts? Yeah, sure. Um, we've been spoiled in a sense. Uh, I would say 90% of our new logos have been introduced to us through Salesforce salespeople picking out the phone and saying, hey, I've got the next opportunity. Um, having said that, I think we're now probably at a 60-40 split in terms of revenue in that 60% of our revenue comes from our arrangements and agreements with our existing clients. Um, so it's great that those new logo introductions come in through Salesforce. Um, but, yeah, the real measure is how are you able to keep those people as repeat customers that you then don't just do one project with but the next and the next and the next. Yeah. I think what now that we're part of the wider Media Monks group, uh, which has been awesome, uh, we're being exposed to some amazing logos. Uh, and opportunities there. So I think we'll see over time. Um, we want to, that relationship with Salesforce is going nowhere. We want to deepen it and deepen it. Um, but also I see that uh, there'll be some really good opportunities around the, the wider group and the existing customer base. Yeah, and I think, you know, your point before, which is just do really good work and be, you know, mindful that you might have to take a bit of a haircut at the beginning to then build that relationship and then, you know, it flows. I think there were really good points around building that Salesforce relationship about the acquisition, right? So, you know, you're going along, your business is scaling really well. You know, why decide to to uh, sell it? Yeah, look, um, it was probably something always in the back of my mind. Uh, we didn't, we weren't out in the market looking. Um, the conversation came from them to us, which was great. Yeah. Uh, look, I. I think there's a personal preference piece in all of this for anyone. So I never set out, ironically, to grow a business and, and to run a business. Uh, I stumbled into it out of consulting. And I'm really comfortable with um, the idea that someone else is now uh, responsible for the whole thing. I think there's different models of exit. Um, our model of exit going into uh, Media Mux was we provided a service they didn't currently have. Yes. And so it, um, it, it's been a place where our team has been able to maintain their own identity. Uh, it's been a place where we've been able to add really clear value because it's not something they already did. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think the, the decision around ending up joining another group for me was based in, yeah, obviously we wanted to have a fair reward for um, what the shareholders had built over time. Um, but also, crucially, it had to be a place that was going to add value to our staff uh, and give them another uh, an opportunity both to do what they keep doing, what they love, uh, but also potential in the future. Yeah, and when, when you did your due diligence, what were the most critical things that you looked for when someone's acquiring you? Because, you know, I've always sat mainly on the other side, right? At Coco, I used to buy companies and we used to joke we'd turn a small company into a smaller company. But- <laughs> That's another, yep. yeah. another thing. Yeah. But for you, you know, what, what were the key due diligence and the questions that you really thought in your head around, should I sell to these guys? Yeah. For me, it was about the journey that the organisation we were joining was going on. Uh, and so uh, this is an entrepreneurial group that has a really aggressive growth plan. And it's just really exciting to see where it's going and what the group is achieving. Uh, there's amazing stuff in uh, uh, virtual reality, amazing creative teams and amazing tech teams. The, here in APAC, they're the leading Google partner. Um, 
it, there's all sorts of so so the actual group itself is in some ways very aligned with us in terms of growth trajectory and so on so that was a key piece of it i think the other bit is just cultural um yeah. and cultures it's a funny word like it yeah it gets overused but yes. but i sat in meetings with people who i felt comfortable with who i felt were transparent and honest and i thought i could sit in an office with them work with tomorrow and so for me that's that's a massive part of it like i don't want if yeah i don't want somewhere that's full of fluff that's full of high aspirations and people that you are worried are a little bit duplicitous and yeah so there was no part of the process at any point in time that i doubted the integrity of the people i was dealing with and uh and the uh yeah, the the type just type of people they were, relatively humble, down to earth, and uh, yeah, felt like an extension of us. Yeah, well, you're you're, you know, let's not debate around who's the best city in Australia, but you're in Sydney, I'm in Melbourne, and uh, you know, the same we often have is, you know, would you have a beer with that person? So uh, I think you know yep. that's it sums it up well, and I think yeah, it's intuitive, and uh, and you know, you got to make sure that that's the the right fit because um, you have know, certainly. Uh, helped and mentored some people that have had a different outcome and I've come in to help resolve it and it's so difficult uh, to do that. No one wins when uh, you pick the wrong one. And and any uh, other tips you'd give for someone that is, you know, potentially going to be uh, acquired? Is there anything else that you change in your business? You know, did you, you know, look to drive more short-term profit? You're like, was it, there anything else that you did that you thought, well, okay, that maximised the, the, um, the value that uh, that you got out of the business. I think the um, set yourself up well f- from the start, yep. and this is a it's an interesting kind of piece around what is it that someone is looking to buy. Um, there's uh, people look at your top line, and they also obviously look at your bottom line, but there's no doubt that in this style of industry. It, it's all about your people. Yeah. And so I you can have an amazing top line and potentially strong bottom line, but actually if all your workforce, for example, is outsourced, um, the people aren't going to look at you and buy you for your profit in that context because they're suddenly looking at the, the labour model, for example, and the value isn't there for them. Uh, I guess I've seen others where... The complexity of shareholding and so on also means that um, for certain groups looking to acquire, um, that can make it overcomplicated and so can be something then that they go, well, actually, no, this isn't a fit for us moving forward because I guess the they're interested in holding on to the key leaders that have made a difference. Yes. And, uh, and if your model is such that those people aren't there or they're not willing to be part of the journey going forward, uh, then also someone looking at a business is going to question whether there's the actual value in the acquisition. Yeah, um, yeah. I think for me there wasn't any game playing. I think for me it's actually around if you're running your business really well, then you're going to be attractive. And and if if you're only focused on acquisition, um, then you're probably going to get your metrics wrong and your focus wrong. If you're focused on running a really good sustainable business and constantly improving it, then you're going to be attractive for someone looking for an acquisition target. Totally agree. You know, it's like anything in life, there's no shortcuts, and I think it's uh, definitely the, the case there. And um, you know, if you're listening now and you think, oh, gee, I haven't started off on the right foot or watching, um, you know, it takes what it's saying, it takes 20 years to, to grow a tree. Well, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best is today. So you can still, you know, take these learnings from Andrew and uh, go and uh, apply them. So uh, we could talk forever, Andrew. I know you've got lots of lot, uh, knowledge and you've shared it uh, very gracefully here. But uh, why don't we go into the deep dive, the sales deep dive to round it out. Are you ready for that? Far away. All right, great. Well, so what are some of the sales habits that you do or maybe you used to do because you're such a great delegator <laughs> to help you accelerate yep. sales? I'm reading Atomic Habits at the moment. If you're looking for a book, pick up that one. Yep. Uh, and it's just about daily repeated tasks. 
when your pipe gets full, don't think your pipe's full. Pick up the phone every day to one new customer, one new AE, and do it, and then do it again. Yeah, well, James is a listener of this program, so uh, shout out to James. No, he's not, but anyway. Hopefully one day is. So uh, other than, you know, your, your suite from Salesforce, what other technology do you use to help to accelerate your sales in the business? Yeah, we've actually used Quilla recently. So Quilla is a proposal tool that, again, uh, not hung up on that in particular, but the idea of trying to make it easy to buy from you. So it's the same as, I mean, it, it yes, it, it helps you pull together templated proposals quickly. Uh, but it also has that e-sign kind of feature that's really easy. So someone can just click accept and uh, move on. Great. And and we talked about, you know, your mix of leads and it was probably Salesforce 90%, but at the moment, the ones that you're getting that aren't Salesforce, what's been the best source of leads in that that area? Yeah, asking uh, existing customers who else we should be talking to. Uh, that's There's no surprise there. I think also just going deep in a particular industry and uh, and then being part of their kind of forums and the places they hang out. Yeah, I think that's spot on, spot on. The last question is a big one. I'll leave it to the end for that reason. But what's one action we can take from today to help us 10x our sales? Yeah, it's, um, it's a bit of copy and paste from earlier. It's pick that area and go deep. Yeah. So it's... Yeah, I'd say that. That's for one. So that industry piece, go deep. Repeatable assets is the other one for me. So we end up doing so much bespoke stuff and it just slows us down. And so we've got a massive focus on building those repeatable assets uh, that just make it easy for guys to have the right sales conversation, but then easy for our guys who are putting it all into place um, to be able to build it. Yeah, and I think, you know, rounding out that from a, a Melbourne analogy is it's like uh, I always talk about our, our uh, football or cricket ground here, our sporting arena, MCG. Uh, you know, to me, it's always not about the fact that it can hold, uh, I think now it's 102,000 or something like that. But, you know, look for, you know, those exact rows and just treat those people really well. It might be 10 rows in a certain section. Treat them well rather than trying to pitch to, to all the crowd. And I think that's why you've been so successful. You've done a brilliant job to, you know, help people, in, whether it be those in Karachi, in Pakistan, right through. You've helped a lot of customers for mid and enterprise, as you said. And, you know, you've been rewarded for running a really good business uh, by that acquisition. And the great thing is that you're on a continual growth path now. So uh, so that's fantastic one. Well done. And you can – I'll put all the links, et cetera, to Andrew, but it's um, – you know, uh, it's just it's destined uh, by Media Monks, and it's MediaMonks.com. You can find out more about Andrew and his uh, amazing team. But uh, yeah, absolutely wonderful having you on and, and sharing uh, your journey, uh, journey and sharing it so humbly. Thanks, Andrew. Appreciate the opportunity. Thanks very much. It was a great interview by Andrew. I just love the fact that he, you know, speaks so openly about his successes and really gave good practical advice, which is fantastic. Uh, I just love the way that he communicated and did that. So the you can find out more about that at Destined. And as I said, uh, you can also go to Media Monks. So that's MediaMonks.com. All the links will be in the show notes. And, you know, there'll be a summary as well in the app that you're listening to. And if you want to go and understand more about this, just go to PaulHigginsMentoring.com uh, forward slash podcast and it's 383. Uh, that's right. No, sorry, 385, I should say, the episode. And uh, why not share some of the learnings that you took from Andrew? So he'd love it if you shared a snippet of what you learned and uh, you know shared it on your socials, et cetera, to give a little bit of love back for all the value that Andrew gave you. And why not share it with some of your peers or colleagues as well? Uh, you know, Some of you here watching or listening are Salesforce partners. You know, why don't you share it with uh, your broader community. And if you want to come join a community of peers, uh, we've got you. So it's the Cloud Consultants Collective. And if you go to paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash CCC, it's a free Slack group where we basically just answer questions of each other in a, in a great community. So if you'd love to, to do that to help scale your business, please join. 
And the last thing is please take action to accelerate your sales. I'm fired up after today's episode. What about you? But hey, before you go, learning is just one piece of the puzzle. Now it's time to put today's strategy into action. Head over now to today's show page at paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash podcast and share how you'll put it into action. Be sure to head over to your favorite podcast platform and subscribe, rate, and review the show. Tell me what your favorite episode is. And don't wait one minute more to gain access to your pulse check at paulhigginsmentoring.com. This could be the difference between struggling to get more leads and making this next quarter your best one yet.